Well, hi, Spring Harvest family. Jeff Lucas here. Great to be joining you. Obviously, we're all in lockdown, but massive appreciation to the uh, Spring Harvest team for enabling this uh, at-home event to be happening. Now, before uh, we jump into this seminar, I, I am just conscious because I'm staring at my own image on screen here. The, the haircut is somewhat unkempt. Obviously, I've not been able to get out to get a haircut, even though the sight of this might cause one to think this was a vital service that should have been continued. And uh, normally I've got this sort of shrinking peninsula on top of my head that looks like Florida, but currently it's expanding into Texas. So I apologize if any small children or indeed domestic pets are somewhat intimidated by the sight of this. Living for Jesus during turbulent times. One of the things I've always appreciated about Spring Harvest as an event over the years is a love for Jesus, a love for the local church, and a love for Scripture. And at times like this, um, we turn to Scripture to find our help and our hope. And so I want to read some words from Acts chapter 11 and verse 19 as we think about following Jesus in the here and now. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Uh, you don't need me to tell you that um, it's been a difficult time. Uh, sudden shock has uh, changed everything with um, businesses affected. People have lost their jobs. Um, some have been displaced even worldwide because of the situation. Uh, there's economic uncertainty, food shortages, panic. By the way, I, I'm not talking about the current crisis in which we find ourselves. I'm talking about a situation that occurred 2,000 years ago. The Jerusalem church, under attack, an attack spearheaded by a man called Saul, who of course later became the Apostle Paul, uh, due to the persecution there, suddenly their lives were turned upside down and they found themselves in uh, a situation of being scattered. And as they left Jerusalem, they left security, left family, left homes, left businesses, left employment. As they scattered, they headed towards a city called Antioch. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire with about half a million population. It was a beautiful city. It was known, it was uh, spoken of as Antioch the Golden, with a main street four miles long, paved with marble. It was a, a busy port. It was a cosmopolitan city with a lot of pagan worship. Antioch, if you will, was the New York of the day, very cosmopolitan international city. But it's there that we find these Christians whose lives had been turned upside down by the turbulence of the persecution, it's there that we find them expressing their faith in a dynamic way. And my hope is that that is what is, that's exactly what's going to happen with us, not in any way underestimating the challenges that we all face. And there are a lot of people asking, well, why is this happening? I, I, I'm wondering whether the, the better question is, what should we do? How should we behave? Historically, during times of incredible turbulence, the church has shone like a light in the darkness. 
in times of pestilence and and uh, the, the the rapid spread of infectious diseases throughout history the church has stepped up and served and shown courage and faith and so what can we learn about living through turbulent times as we look at these these Christians who show up in in Antioch the first thing is this I, I think we need to be those who uh, express our commitment afresh to the value of the local church. Uh, we read here that Barnabas and Saul met with the church, Acts 11, 25. Um, and we also read in Acts 13, now in the church at Antioch. This was the first great church among the Gentiles, the first world mission apostolic uh, mission sending church. And out of this incredible turbulence came this massive opening gateway to the Gentiles. This, this time of terror and fear, it was somehow redeemed and God uh, opened the hearts of many in the Gentile community. As we are separated, as we are not able to gather and we miss our physical gatherings, both in the local church and at events like Spring Harvest, let's reaffirm how much not only we value church, but how much God values church. Because up until this crisis, we've been busier than ever. Uh, it saddens me to say that in the church in America, the average church attendance now is one and a half times a month, even among committed Christians. Uh, I think that might be mirrored in a similar way here in the UK, although I'm not sure. And we've done a massive pendulum swing away from the days when some of us can remember if you didn't go to church every time the doors were opened, you were very probably going to hell. And we've swung away from that into, um, into an individualized selfie culture where because we're so busy, because we're so stimulated in other ways, we can forget the value of being a dynamic and active part of the church, the people of God. But God has always been about building a community. Philip Yancey, in his book, Vanishing Grace, he says, if you want to summarize the theme of the entire Bible, Old and New Testament, Yancey says it's like this, God gets his family back. And um, in the Garden of Eden, it begins with a family. Um, and in the book of Revelation, it ends with the family of God marching into eternity with God. And I think we need to reaffirm our commitment to and our valuing of the local church because we the people of God carry the vital message the message of hope the message of good news a survey was conducted um, and people were asked what are your favorite three sentences that you most love to hear and the three sentences the, the, num the number one favorite perhaps predictably was I love you uh, the second favorite was, I forgive you. And the third favorite was, supper's ready. I love you, I forgive you, supper's ready. These are the st sentences that people just love to hear. And that's the gospel message. God saying to an orphan humanity, I love you, I forgive you, supper's ready. T.S. Eliot says, what is life if we have not life together. And so let's let's express again our commitment to and our valuing of the local church. And let me make a, a controversial statement. Let's stop attending the church. You say, what? Isn't that just a contradiction of everything you've just said, Jeff? No, let's stop attending church because I don't attend my family. I don't attend my marriage my family, my friendships, my marriage, they are grafted into my heart. I don't just attend them. They are a matter of priority and, and a lifeline to me. Let's not just attend the local church, but let's be committed to, grafted into the family of God. When it's difficult, when people offend us, when the sermon's boring, when the worship leader says, let's sing that song again for the 257th time, when th that lady's hat, that lady sitting 
in front of us, when her hat eclipses the sun, when one of those new people that has come into the church um, takes our pew, the one that Jesus gave us. Let's be committed to the local church. And then also I see that these were a people of everyday confident witness. Look at what we read here in verse 20. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And then later in verse 24, a great number of people were brought to the Lord. There are two words used here. One is about um, declaration, proclamation, and the other is about conversation. And so perhaps in their, in their gatherings, in their preaching, but also outside of their gatherings, in their everyday conversation, they were sharing the good news of Jesus. Here's a question. Whatever happened to evangelism? When I became a Christian back in 1837, we talked about evangelism a lot. And frankly, some of our attempts at reaching our friends, they, they were a, a bit cringy. Um, for me personally, I'd turn every conversation around to Jesus. Someone would say, um, hello, Jeff, would you like a cheese sandwich? And I'd say, no, thank you, because I have the bread of life. How about you? And evangelism was a bit of a monologue, and we breathlessly tried to um, convert people, which is not our job. And I wonder whether we've done a pendulum swing away from some of that cheesy, forgive the pun, approach to evangelism. And we've misquoted St. Francis of Assisi, that chap who was not only famous for chatting with passing squirrels, but also gave everything he had to the poor. And uh, St. Francis has been quoted as saying, by all means, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words, which, by the way, is a misrepresentation of that quote. And also, he was a passionate evangelist who used a lot of words, often visiting two or three villages in one day to preach, to declare the gospel. Is it time to get our voices back in evangelism? And I'm noticing during this lockdown period a new freedom to um, talk with neighbours at government guideline distancing, of course, um, and to express um, to those around me something of my faith in Christ, not shoving it down their throats, not being opportunistic, exploiting this moment, but taking the opportunity to gently, caringly express hope and faith in Christ. At a time like this, let's get our voices back. I also noticed there was a real culture of encouragement um, among these people. When Barnabas, who was sent by the Jerusalem church to check out what was going on, he said when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. It's amazing this because Barnabas... Um, He's actually renamed because of his fabulous encouragement gift. I mean, imagine that. Imagine us being named after our primary characteristic. My renaming possibly might refer to my hairstyle. I need to move on from mentioning my hairstyle. I know it's a bit of an obsession. But Barnabas was such an encourager that they changed his name to reflect that spectacular gift. Let me ask this question. Are we those who love to catch people doing something right or delight in catching people saying or doing something wrong? Are we encouragers? That simple uh, note of kindness, that friendly email, that phone call to a neighbor to check that they're doing okay, that willingness to express our love for our friends where Sometimes we've reserved our greatest comments of affection for a funeral when it's rather too late for that friend or loved one to hear those words of love and kindness. Walt Disney, famous for those Magic Kingdoms and Mickey Mouse and all of that, he, he, said, there are, he said that there were three types of people in the world. There are the well poisoners who are gifted with draping others with blankets of discouragement and they love to tell others what they can't do and they love to trample on dreams and snuff out sparks of creativity. We should avoid the well poisoners if we can, especially if we own a well. Then there are the lawn mowers. They're nice people, highly moral and meticulous, but they're exclusively concerned with their own lives. 
um, which includes, I suppose, manicuring their lawn. And they love pristine gardens that they own. They fuss endlessly over them, but they never move a muscle uh, to help the guy next door. And if you're going to have an emergency, pray that it doesn't happen on the, their doorstep because it won't be in, or rather they won't be in. And then in Disney's experience, there are the life enhancers, those beautiful souls who are quick to reach out and live with their eyes and their hearts open. They are fueled with a passion to strengthen and enrich others. They lift up, they inspire. And of course, we've all been heartened. We thank God for those, at time of speaking, over three quarters of a million uh, NHS volunteers who are, are making a difference. Here's the challenge. Barnabas was an encourager to these scattered people. How do we do when it comes to encouragement? I've often, uh, over the years, told a story about my friend Darry Northrup, with whom I work at Timberline Church in Colorado. Darry's good at golf, actually. He's irritatingly good at everything. And I'm terrible at golf. I don't have a swing. I have a spasm. And um, we were out playing golf one time. He took his first shot, which wasn't quite a hole in one, but almost. And I applauded feebly, but my heart wasn't really in it. And then it was my turn. And, and um, I took my shot and I hit the ball straight into the water. And uh, Darry clapped and smiled and he said, uh, great shot, Lucas. I said, what do you mean great shot? I just hit the ball straight into the water. He said, Jeff, you just hit the ball. Catching people doing something right. It doesn't have to be a masterpiece. It doesn't have to be genius. Let's encourage each other. Perhaps very poignantly, these people in Antioch also speak to us about a mature attitude towards suffering. A lot of suffering had come to these folks. Uh, we read now those who've been scattered by the persecution. So persecution uh, was the beginning of their troubles. And, um, and it didn't end there uh, because they were called Christians first in Antioch. Now we might think, oh, isn't that nice? They first started being called Christians. Excuse me, quick slurp of the coffee. Not normally done in Spring Harvest seminars, but these are different days. This was a, a badge um, of disdain when they were called Christians. It, it, people were being rude about them. Apparently there was a fanatical group of um, emperor worshippers in Antioch. They were known as the Augustiani. They worshipped the Emperor Nero with great passion. So when the Christians show up, the Jesus people, they call them the Christianoi, lining them up with other fanatics, if you will, in the city. And so I want us to see this picture here of the way these Christians are living their lives, the circumstances in which they find themselves. They've lost everything. They have been scattered by the persecution. They find themselves in Antioch. They are an object of derision. Life is tough, but I want us to see something here because it, right in the middle of this description of these challenges, we read in verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them. What? The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. I, I want us to really see this, that they are in great trouble, but the Lord's hand is with them. They're there is no contradiction between the two. And the fact that the Lord's hand was with them did not prevent them from going through trouble and uh, huge challenges. This idea of the Lord's hand, it's a favorite term of Dr. Luke's. It's kind of Old Testament language. And Luke talks about the Lord's hand being with John the Baptist and being with the apostles in performing miracles and being against uh, Elimas the sorcerer in judgment. The Lord's hand was with, was with them, but they still suffered. Now, I'm no expert in suffering. A few years ago, um, I was in a restaurant in London and I caught swine flu. Um, it wasn't on the menu, but I caught it. And uh, that developed into pneumonia. And it was very, very serious. I almost died from um the two or three week bout of pneumonia. My body was not responding to the antibiotics. And I mentioned on Facebook that I was unwell and 
uh, some well-meaning Christians, some of whom I think had previously been employed by Job, they jumped on. One person said, "You know, you're not you're not really you're not really sick. You just think you're sick." And I'm like, "I, th- I think the evidence is in. I've got a high temperature. I've lost eight pounds. Um, I'm sweating profusely. I, I think I think I'm I'm sick." And somebody rebuked Satan on Facebook, which I was intrigued by. It was well-meaning, but I didn't even know that Satan was on Facebook. And others said, you know, you've not got enough faith or your great-great-grandfather sinned or, or whatever. And frankly, it was all very, very unhelpful. And I think that when we see suffering, we should be slow to speak and quick to pray and quick to care. I just want us to pause and see this picture of a suffering people. They are in turbulent times, but that does not mean that God has abandoned them. It does not mean that the Lord's hand is not with them. No, on the contrary, Luke affirms, God's hand was upon them and with them. God was for them during this season of turbulence. And it's so easy to say that, and it can sound like a slogan, like a cliche. But it's true. We will never ever be alone again as we find ourselves today in Christ. There will be times when we will feel abandoned. And the scriptures acknowledge that. The Psalms, three of the most frequent prayers in the Psalms go like this. Why? How long? Where have you gone? And those psalms of lament don't end with easy answers. We are called to trust. We are called to understand that our emotions are not the barometer of our spirituality. We are called to battle a sense of sadness. We should feel sad when young nurses die, when, when we look at the huge population in India and wonder what will happen to them because social isolation in, in a slum is not easy to say the least. We know the incredible challenges that folks around the world are experiencing. We should feel sad. And there's a certain lethargy that we experience too, because we can go out to exercise, at least at the time of this recording we could, but it feels weird. It's quiet. That stranger that walks towards us with a mask, are they just taking hygienic precautions or are they in fact a failed bank robber on the way home from trying to rob a bank but like everything else it was shut so that didn't work should we say hello who gives way to who when bombarded with with tragic headlines on the news and so we turn off the news and we we turn on the tv and to escape headlines of death and despair and political intrigue we watch TV filled with death and despair and political intrigue. We do feel sad at this time, but we do need to know in the midst of those turbulent emotions in turbulent times that the Lord's hand is still with us and upon us and he will not abandon us. Well, the last thing I notice from all of this is that there is beautiful grace shared in this scattered community living through times of turbulence. Because the persecution was spearheaded, as I mentioned earlier, by Saul, who later became Paul. And Barnabas works with the Antioch church for a while, but the work overwhelms him. And so he comes up with a brainwave. He decides to go in search of his old friend, Saul, who um, had been in Tarsus by now for around 10 years. We don't know anything about what what Saul did during what's known as his hidden years. And Barnabas comes up with a completely ridiculous idea of having Saul, who became Paul, as the co-pastor of this congregation. Now, just think about that. These people are only in Antioch because of that man. They've lost their homes. They've lost family members. They've lost everything because of him. And then at the annual general church meeting, or whatever you like to call it, Barnabas stands up and says, um, we've decided to appoint another leader. Um, Some of you might recognize him. And Saul stands up. And Dr. Luke doesn't say, isn't this incredible? 
He doesn't even highlight it. You, you might not even notice it because grace is what the church does. Welcome is what we're supposed to do. There is ongoing grace here shared without fuss. And let me just say as a church leader, these have been challenging times for leaders as we've tried to respond to rapidly shifting circumstances and church is not as usual and traditions may have been lost and we've had to adapt and we don't always get it right and the live feed breaks down or the sermon on audio or video doesn't work correctly or it wasn't entirely suited to that particular moment because when that leader recorded it then there was a subsequent headline and it seemed insensitive and let's face it there's always something that we can criticize but we should be a people of grace not just to leaders but to each other at this time, ongoing grace shared without fuss. What I do see as I wrap up this time, and I hope you found it helpful, we see a people not just surviving turbulence, but thriving in the midst of turbulence. That didn't mean, that doesn't mean that it was easy. It doesn't mean that the sun quickly came out behind the clouds and that their suffering ended, but as they were as they were faithful, as they were, as they were gracious, as they suffered, yet with the knowledge that the Lord's hand was upon them, as Barnabas encouraged them, and I'm sure they encouraged each other, as they continued to share the good news of Jesus, both in preaching, in proclamation, and in everyday conversation, and as they were committed to each other, so they navigated their way through their turbulence season, with great grace, with great faith, and we are beneficiaries today of their heritage. I think Her Majesty the Queen said in her one of her speeches recently that she hoped that future generations would look back upon us and see that we did well in this season. Beautiful words, thank God for her. May it also be true that we particularly, especially the people of God, that we shine in the darkness, that we are truly a beacon, that in our fragility, in our struggling, sometimes in our doubts, in our own brokenness, we're not perfect people, we're not superhuman, but Christ is in us, his hope is ours, and he who began the work in us will be faithful. May we too be found faithful to him. I'd like to pray. Perhaps you could join me. Father, thank you for your people who are able uh, during this time to be able to tune in to Spring Harvest in a way that's never been done before. Wherever people are gathering around screens to watch this, some by themselves in isolation alone, others in families, would you strengthen each one, particularly those who are unwell those who are fearful for friends and family members who currently battle sickness, those who grieve loss, would you draw close? May your hand be felt upon your people. And at this time, Lord, as we pray for national and international leaders, we ask you to strengthen them, grant them wisdom. We pray for solutions. We pray for treatment. We pray for vaccines. We pray for our national health um, heroes and for all those who serve in the public sector, keeping life going at this time. We pray for leaders of your church that you will grant them grace and wisdom too. Thank you, Lord, that through turbulent times, you are with us. We will never be alone again. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Wherever you are, God bless you and keep you. Thanks for tuning in.